if you install the Venus Project throughout the world, declare all the Earth's resources as the common heritage of all the world's people. See, Mark Twain said, there's not an acre of land on Earth that belongs to its rightful owners. So over the years, powerful nations took land from others. This includes the United States, Germany, France. They're all corrupt. I'm sorry about that. But all nations are corrupt. As long as you use money, you can pay off senators, <coughs> the drug company can buy time. So you can't have decency and ethics in a corrupt world. But are you talking about a utopia? No. There's no such thing. The reason there is no such thing as utopia is because if you design the best building you know how to design, that's the best you know up to now. With the advent of a new material, the city will keep changing. There's no best laptop. Next year it'll be smaller, lighter, wider range. Cameras no longer use film. So you can't design the best camera. You can only design the best that you know of up to now. No utopias, no final frontiers. But for you, your vision of the future... is always changing. But it's dependent on technology. Yes. Technology and knowledge in all fields. Today, uh, scientists who specialize in optics, another guy rockets, so the nation can use them any way they want to. In the future, people will be educated to be generalists, so no one can use you to make weapons of destruction. But you look at some of your designs, some of yes. your visions for the future, and people say, yeah, look, it's like you might have seen in popular mechanics in the 50s. You know, this is what's going to be like in 1999. You know? No, it's nothing like that. Hollywood shows you spaceships and people using laser weapons. They take the same cowboys and Indians and put them in spaceships. That is not the future. That's man's concept of this limited society that doesn't teach you how to think and look ahead. They teach you how to be a cameraman, auto mechanic, um, chemist, or a structural engineer. They don't give you an overview of society. For people to embrace what you're talking about. Well, they, it's not my system, really. If we don't live in accordance with the nature of, of the earth, if we don't live in accordance with the natural resources, we can't live. You, you can't designate a population of 10 million without doing a study of the resources you have. After you study, we have enough resources to support so many billions of people. And if you exceed that, you're going to have starvation, malnutrition, territorial disputes. If you maintain a population in accordance with the carrying capacity of the earth, no opinions of senators. Politics was great a hundred years ago. Today it's all obsolete. But aren't you really? You're talking revolution. Because you're saying no. when society breaks Technical down... Technical revolution. Yeah, but when society breaks down, then they'll want to do it a different way. I'm sorry about that, but it seems that conditions were so abusive in some lands that they put in socialism, communism, whatever, or fascism that fits the conditions that people live under. None of them are the solution. All governments, all through history, have been corrupt. So in that case, the rise of the Nazis in Germany was perfectly logical. It was logical within their conditioning. In other words, Hitler did not lead Germany that way, but what he spoke of was acceptable to the German people, obviously. He was put there by German big business and industry. And the working man had no voice. He thought he was a communist or socialist. Uh, Hitler's system would not have worked even if he won the war. You must know that people look at your concepts. Yes, I know. And, and with utmost respect, Chuck, they will say, I you're know. a crazy old man. I understand that. This is not unusual. Every move from women's rights the child labor were fought with battles all the time. No new system ever came in smoothly. Even in the army, the cavalry fought the war tanks. When the war tanks came in, they fought the guided missile. Now the guided missile people are fighting lasers from weapons in the sky. Then they have a bomb called the flicker bomb. It's a bright light goes on and off. It gives you an epileptic seizure. 
and doesn't destroy the environment. Now they're in control. But there's no limit to what man can do. Man is the dumbest animal. He pollutes the air, ocean, the air, the rivers, the atmosphere, and people. Man, they put himself on a pedestal, say we're the highest form of life. That's an ego trip. They're not. We're not civilized yet. As long as you have prisons, police, armies, navies, we are not civilized. Until the world learns to live together constructively, that'll be the beginning of the scientific age. We're not there yet. During the time of the Wright brothers, the scientists of the time were writing about books, were writing books as to why man can't fly. And the Wright brothers didn't read those books, so they went right on and built the flying machine. Goddard couldn't speak about rocketry in the scientific fields because he'd be looked at as a quack. So the, all through history, the scientists of the times were saying how things could not progress. But how do you convince people? I'm going to try to explain that. How do you convince them? First of all, no one has an opinion. See, they bring you up to everyone should have a right to their own opinion. If your sister lived across the way from me and I see ten guys coming out of her apartments, I can have all kinds of opinions. The most difficult thing for people to say is, I don't know. Do you think a man will ever get to the moon? I don't know enough about rockets or the prop. I don't know. But today, when people say, well, if you ask me, not in a thousand years, I'm not interested in that. What do you know about space travel, machinery, rocketry, nothing? Then I don't want to hear from you. You progress you just... People like just yak on about anything if you give them all a right to their own opinion. In the future... Here's the way they'll talk. If they see an airplane without wings in the future, they'll say, how do you propose to live off the ground without wings? Today they say, it'll never fly, it doesn't have wings. They have an opinion about everything, and that's dangerous. That's why nations don't move forward. But you look at you now, I mean, you're touring around, you're talking to people. Yes. What, for the next seven months you're going to travel the world? Yes. And you're 94 years old? Yes. You haven't got anything better to do? No, not now. I'm afraid of the direction that man is taking. We, we have bombs now that are like a thousand times greater than one dropped on Hiroshima. How stupid can you be? What can you accomplish with that? The United States has 300 submarines, and according to the Navy, each one has more destructive power than all the wars in history. What do you want to accomplish with that? A burnt out radioactive planet? You won the war? What do you win? It's much easier to bring the nations of the world together, not kill those that don't agree with you. Bring them together. If I took every soldier, I would educate them to be problem solvers, not killing machines. If they draft you to serve, to put up your life for your country, they should conscript all the war industries so no one makes a buck out of war, then it's real. You don't have that. What can one man do, though? Talk to other people. If you like what the Venus Project stands for, talk to others. If you do nothing, nothing will happen. I can assure you that. I have no power. Roxanne has no power. It's merely a presentation of a world without war, hunger, poverty, or job loss. It's always been one person who's come up with new ideas, and when other people hear about it, then they work towards it and, and do what they can to make it happen. But it's usually one person that's come up with different ideas. Do you, do you see him as a genius? Well, no, I see him who would, as somebody who's gone through certain things during his lifetime and arrived at different conclusions. His background was very different. He, he was... He worked in technology. He was a futurist, but most technology, most futurists don't talk about the future in terms of technology. They have wishes and aspirations and hopes and dreams. He can build these things technically. He's worked with drug addicts, alcoholics, changed them. He even joined the Klan. He wanted to see if he could what put plan? his ideas to test. He joined the Ku Klux Klan in the United States and changed them within a month and a half. Then joined the White Citizens Council and changed them. It's not just coming out of his head saying, I would like a different world, he worked at it and worked at people to change them. You joined the Klan? The Ku Klux Klan. Years ago, uh, there was about 32 members. 
So I joined them by talking. First, that leader said to me, what do you think of the Ku Klux Klan? It's a great idea, but it doesn't go far enough. Then they listen. But if you down it, they don't listen. You understand? What yeah. You have to learn different people's values and speak in their terms, not your terms. If you speak ahead of the terms of people, they don't know what you're talking about. So in New York, I asked a question. What are the most undeveloped people in the area? I got one consensus. They said the Arabs that live in Atlantic Avenue. I said, what makes you think they're backward? They still believe the earth is flat. So I said, I, I better try to turn them around because if I can't turn them around, how am I going to change the world? That's why I joined the Klan, the White Citizen Council. So I called the leader of the Arabs in that area. And I said, I would like to speak with you. He said, you are Arab? That's all he can say. I said, yes, I'm not Arab. So he said, where your father he born? I said, Lebanon. He said, very good, come and saw me. Means come and see me. So I came to see him. And I said, do you believe the world's around? He said, no. So he said to me, do you believe? I said, no. He said, that means it can't be. Then he pointed to his head. He says, if the world he round, man fall me down. All the water he fall me down. Kept doing that. So I said, boy, I've got to get to this guy. So I gave him a balloon, which I brought with me, and I rubbed it with fur. I put cornflakes in his hand and told him to hold his hand away from the balloon. You know what happens if you rub them, all the cornflakes go up to the balloon. And his jaw hit the pavement. He said, world, he magnet, air. Ah! And he explained that to all the other Arabs. It took an hour and a half to turn him around by demonstration. But if you use language, scientific, centrifugal force, geomagnetic fields, they don't know what the heck they're talking about. Did you turn around the clan, though? Oh, yes. You want me to tell you how? Yeah. Okay. It was a longer process. What I did is I spoke to the leader only, took him to my lab, showed him a lot of interesting things, and he said in his southern accent, will you come on down to the clan meeting and, and talk to our boys? I said, they wouldn't listen to me, Lou. He said, I'll get them to listen to you, because what you say makes sense. I showed him a lot of things he never knew existed. So he silenced them, and I spoke to them a little bit. Then I said, Lou, you can look at a person, tell us all about him. How do you do that? He said, well, I didn't think I can teach you anything. I said, well, if you can do that, tell me how it's done. So I brought some pictures down to the clan meeting and projected them on the wall. And Lou said, he looks like a good man, a God-fearing man, uh, American veteran, projecting his own values. On the end of the picture, I pulled out the bottom and says, wanted by the FBI for subversive action against the United States. When he used to speak, he just said anything, and the others, not knowing anything, shook their head. This is the first time what he said didn't make sense, so his group started to laugh at him. So I said to the guy, shut your mouth, because Lou knows more about people than we do. I had to defend him till the next film. The next film is a record of a man talking in an Oxford accent about aviation. He says, I see a skinny Englishman with a bald head and eyeglasses. He's projecting his own values. Now then, ten minutes later, the image comes on. It's a black guy raised in England. It's a goddamn nigger talking like an Englishman. This is Lou's reaction, not my words. And I said, Lou, that guy was raised in a dis different environment. If you took a black man and raised him in France, he'd speak like a Frenchman, if he was a baby. If you raised him in Germany, he'd speak with a German accent. He said, you mean to say that a black man speaks that way because he's raised? Yes. I said, Lou, if I took your kid and raised it in a Jewish family, he'd be a nice Jewish boy. In a Nazi family, a nice Nazi. People are not taught how to think. They reflect their culture. Proof that in Italy you talk with your hands. Manada de Americano. See, you say, come on, they eat, there's good food. That's not you, that's the environment impinging upon you. We don't teach children how to think. So it's nurture versus nature, the great yeah. debate. Nature. Uh, environment shapes values, facial expressions. If you were brought up in the deep south, you speak with a southern accent. And if all you hear 
It's a damn niggers are lazy, they don't do it. If that's all you hear, that's what you reflect. So you might say, I'm going to get me a nigger and I'm going to kick his ass. Is that you or a reflection of your culture? Think about it. So if, I was, if I was a serial killer? All right, here's what makes a serial killer. There was a guy named, in the early days, this guy, I believed, ate 45 children. The public wanted to tear him to pieces because the public looks at him as free will. I look at it as indoctrination. Now, what kind of indoctrination makes a serial killer? So a psychiatrist named Wortham wrote a book called Show of Violence. Most people never read it. Essentially, here's the guts of it. When he was about eight years old, he was touching his private parts. And his mother was an old-time Baptist. She said, you're going to burn in hell touching my body and body. You will burn eternally. She scared the hell out of the kid. And that evening, the mother said he stuck needles into his genitals. He didn't want to go to hell. Can you understand that? So he used to go into the woods with minority children and try to cut their genitals off to save them from hell. What do you think a soldier is? A guy that's shown motion pictures of a Japanese guy raping an American woman pregnant. And so the guy, enlistment goes up. So taking the retort to hate, before the war, remember, it was pretty parasol and fan in far off Japan. Now, slanty-eyed bastards. The Germans are not people, they're krauts. All nations are corrupt. They all teach their people to hatred, hatred and to be patriotic. Einstein said patriotism is a disease. You're it not, separates people. You're not born with bigotry, prejudice, anger or envy, you, it's nurtured, you experience that through your environment. If you approached a headhunter in the Amazon and said, oh my God, don't you feel terrible? You have 10 shrunken heads. He may say, yes, my brother has 20. Is he bad? No. So how, if we know what is, I mean, we can look at all the influences on society that are negative. They don't know how to do that today. And we come to what, we look at this vision that yeah. you have. How, again, how do we get there? Because a lot of people have no vested interest I know. in abandoning the way things are done. We want to make a major motion picture showing how we get from here to there. It's not going to be smooth. It's going to have a lot of problems, a lot of assassinations. This is normal to that much of a change. If you want to bring, but if you want to try to patch up the old system, it'll take many years and many wars. We don't have the time. If all nations are building nuclear weapons now, because they don't trust each other. Now, is your life in danger? What? I, if you come up with something, it's so. My life is always in danger. It's always been in danger. I developed the first flying wing aircraft. I had nothing but trouble. I worked on long hours of children working in factories and tried to stop that. I'm 94 now. I do all I can do. Rather than fear death, I don't fear death. I fear where man is going. The hell they can produce is unbelievable because of human, not really human stupidity. They're not educated in our schools. Our universities are better equipped than ever, and the wars are getting worse. So how can we be sane if the weapons are getting worse? Roxanne, he doesn't worry about himself, but do you worry about him? Because if the things he is talking about I, Freak I, in the natural order, don't they? Well, the established we, order. We both are very afraid of where things are going out there. And if you sit back and do nothing, nothing will happen. So he's been working on a new approach all his life that nobody else is dealing with. They're all trying to patch up this system, and it's this monetary system that creates the aberrant behavior, that creates the pollution, that creates the... the terrible situation between people and the environment. So if we, if we sit back and do nothing, this will continue to go right down to, to the ground. And what it takes is introducing these new ideas. People think of, of it in terms of socialism, communism, free enterprise system, or fascism. Nothing has been introduced. So we want to show it in film to show people really just what type of future they can have if they work together and create and make all the, the um, natural resources as the common heritage of all the Earth's people. This is the only way we'll go beyond what we're doing today. Otherwise, there'll be more and more suffering if we don't use the scientific method applied to the way we live. You will never stop, will you? You will never stop. The, the, uh, the language we use today was designed hundreds of years ago. 
that makes it impossible to talk to one another. When you read the Bible, it's subject to interpretation. People say Jesus meant this, no, he meant that. So you got the Lutheran, Seventh Day Adventist, the Catholic. So we need a language that's not subject to interpretation. Mathematics, chemistry, when chemists talk to each other, it's not, I think you mean this. When structural engineers build a bridge, they talk to each other and they understand exactly. We need that in the common language. Otherwise, all when you talk to a person, I don't care if it's your wife or children, it goes through the head, comes out different as they think you mean it. That's the danger of the world today. So people say to you, have a nice weekend. Why don't they say, have a nice life? Why just a weekend? Because that's a normal thing. They don't know what they're talking about, most people. Now, how do I get up and turn them around by identifying with their values and gradually, as fast as I can, I'll take them into the new world. You're sneaky. See, here's where people get mad at me. They say, you want to give people things for nothing. I said, if you're born in America and England and France, you got the airplane, the automobile, the telephone, the electric light, you didn't work on any of that. You got it for nothing. Does it hurt you? No. There's nothing wrong with having people access whatever they need without money. We can turn out volumes of goods today with automation and make it available to everybody. That's the end of most crime. Most crime. Could you ever see yourself stopping? Stopping thinking, stopping advocating? Well, a brain disease uh, or aging, maybe, might have a stroke and not be able to do it. That's possible in this world. But in the future I talk about, everyone is cared for from babies to old age, and no one is in authority. We don't tell people how to live. All the machines do is make goods available, transported. They do not control people. And that's possible? Yes. It was possible in 1927. At the beginning of automation and fabrication. But we're terrified of the machines taking over. That's because they take your job away. See, in the future, when a new machine comes in, we call the help and say, you used to work eight hours a day, now it's four. You used to have a week, two weeks vacation a year, now it's six weeks to be with your family and all. So <coughs> machines are no longer used to aggrandize the powerful. They can't lay you off. The machines are now operated for the benefit of all humanity. There's no more separate nations with artificial boundaries. If single nations control most of the resources, there's going to be trouble. Has to be, continuously. There'll always be war and rumors of war if you keep it this way. It's only when the earth is declared the common heritage of all the world's people, that's the end of territorial invasion. If you don't understand that, I'm sorry, I give you all the examples you want. I know what makes those trouble. Some people do as they were working, I do. Do what you can. If you do nothing, nothing will happen. Everybody that brought liberation to women's rights, black rights, Polish rights, it is not as what you want. All people need the same thing, free access to the necessities of life, otherwise they suffer. Now what's so difficult about that? It's the movies that make people fearful of technology. It, they really project the free enterprise system into the future, and all these robots and technology are working against people. Well, that's what they do today. So they are afraid of technology today, with the bombs and the missiles and the war and the technology that displaces people, and they have no purchasing power. But that's not what a resource-based economy would do. They'd use technology for the benefit of people and the environment. All over the world. Finally, how achievable is this? If, if everything uh, okay. went according to plan... According to Peter Joseph, who started the Zeitgeist Movement, he told me two months ago that 50 million people now know about the Venus Project and are all working toward it. So I have a whole pile of magazines from all over the world, each one talking about the Venus Project positively. 
The Zeitgeist Movement is the activist arm of the Venus Project. After Peter Joseph did the film Zeitgeist Addendum, it became well known all over the world. And now there are chapters in almost every city in the United States and every country all over the world, and they're working towards these ends. They're talking to people, they're, they're introducing it in their media, in their TV, in any way that they can. It really depends on what people do to make this come about. We don't want to hurt anybody or kill anybody. Because we don't look down at anybody. We look them, at them as victims of culture. It's not their fault. 